All right, we'll get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's so nice to see people joining from all over the world uh, for our webinar on autonomous innovation. Today, I'm uh, joined by Jeff Gibbons in New York. He's our managing director uh, for Americas and also ent an enthusiast around uh, AI powered innovation. Uh, and as a quick intro uh, on myself, I'm founder and currently global CEO of uh, Board of Innovation. And if you don't know us yet, we're a global uh, innovation firm working with uh, the global uh, Fortune 500 uh, on imagining and creating tomorrow's products uh, and services. And from all of that work today, we want to give you uh, our take on how we see that evolving uh, with AI and give you our perspective on the future of innovation uh, with AI. So unlike the previous webinar, which you might have joined, which was very practical and tactical. Uh, this will be more uh, conceptual and high level talking about where things could go. Um, and then the next webinar, uh, already giving you a sneak peek, will be more uh, tactical uh, again around uh, specifically synthetic uh, research and testing. But so for today, our take on uh, autonomous innovation, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, drop them uh, in the chat uh, so we can answer them when uh, we have the time. So uh, the story for today is that we'll introduce you to uh, what autonomous innovation is and why we believe that is where things are headed. Uh, we're going to look at some of the foundational elements of building towards a new innovation uh, engine in that scenario. Uh, and give you some thoughts on where to start shaping your strategy around uh, all of this. Um, and we'll close it off with an invitation uh, and also with uh, a Q&A session uh, when we have the time uh, available at, at the end of the session. And there will also be some interactive moments uh, during the session. So I hope you'll all stay tuned uh, and be with us for uh, this hour. So first of all, I want to introduce you to uh, autonomous innovation, uh, which, as I stated, is our perspective on where we sing, see things going uh, with AI-powered uh, innovation. Before we get to that, it's important to understand that all of this is driven by the rapid evolution of artificial intelligence, moving beyond machine learning and deep learning uh, of the past uh, decade, Moving into generative AI uh, in the past year, AI that generates new contents like text with uh, ChatGPT, Cloud, and others, images with the likes of Adobe Firefly, Midjourney, uh, and others, as well as whole virtual worlds with the likes of Runlabs uh, and, and others as well. Uh, but it's likely not to, to stop here and evolve further into more autonomous uh, AI, or as uh, the co-founder of uh, DeepMind called it last week, interactive AI, which is basically AI models that operate more autonomously to accomplish goals. So that move beyond currently uh, prompting uh, the likes of ChatGPT and getting a single answer back. Uh, AI models will be capable of interacting with different software systems, with your in-house uh, data pools, interacting with people even, so they can accomplish a more holistic task and get you the result of that whole task rather than just um, uh, a, a Q&A, uh, basically. And just to show you like some early uh, example of a uh, more autonomous uh, AI uh, model, just want to quickly uh, show you uh, a quick demo of Agent API, which is, a, is a, an early uh, prototype of an autonomous um, AI agent. So I created one called Research GPT, and I asked it to perform market research on the global uh, top five non-alcoholic beers. Um, and then you start, you, you see it generates its, its own tasks, for example, retrieving the latest sales data, conducting a survey amongst non-alcoholic beer consumers, analyze customer reviews from Amazon uh, and the likes. And then it starts executing on the tasks that it's self-generated based on the goal that I set for uh, the autonomous AI agent. And it starts to execute the task, learns from the tasks, and then adapts and, and moves along in trying to complete the whole goal. 
Uh, at the moment, these systems are, are very much in, in beta version. They obviously don't have access to your proprietary data sets yet, not to all of the market research you wanted to have. But it shows the potential of what we talk about when we're mentioning the next step beyond generative AI and more autonomous uh, interactive uh, AI. And that underpins our uh, perspective on where we see innovation uh, evolving uh, as well. Now, let's, let's have a look at what typically happens at first when a new technology emerges. So typically what happens is that we copy what was already there uh, and we copy that straight on the new technology platform, almost as is. Um, as an analogy, like the first time we moved newspapers on an online format or on mobile, it was basically a PDF version of the, the paper version of, of the newspaper. And only after a while, we start shaping what could be with the new technology, basically starting from scratch and looking at like which new opportunities the new technology unlocks and um, creating personalized news streams, uh, suggested news articles based on what your network is reading, aggregating news articles across uh, platforms and news sources, uh, and, and all of those uh, things that we currently uh, have. Now, when we look at uh, the emergence of generative AI and autonomous AI, what we're seeing is that so far we've mostly done the same in leveraging those models for uh, innovation. So what we've mostly done is looked at the current tasks that we are doing within the innovation process. For example, we're running customer interviews. So let's ask ChatGPT to uh, draft um, an interview script uh, for me. So we're basically improving uh, or automating the current innovation tasks uh, with AI. Whereas the interesting question is to move beyond that uh, and ask ourselves the question, how might we shape innovation in an entirely new and better way uh, with AI, almost starting uh, from scratch? And for that, I think it's important to, to always keep in mind innovation's real job to be done, if you want. Uh, and that isn't innovation's job to be done isn't to run 100 customer interviews or to create five prototypes. If you zoom out and look at the overall, the holistic A to B from a corporate CEO's perspective, that is to um, be a reliable engine for growth by imagining, creating and launching new products that are successful on the market and that become an integral and important part of a company's uh, portfolio. That is the overall job to be done. And whether we perform 100 customer interviews for that or we create a thousand prototypes, those are just intermediary steps in the current innovation process. But maybe in the future, we don't need some of those steps and we can do that in a totally different way. I think that's the mindset that we should be adopting into creating what's next uh, for innovation uh, itself. So uh, let's take it a step uh, forward into what innovation could be when powered by AI uh, and just give you a flavor of what we see as possible. So we would see companies that are able to serve uh, customers' needs before you can actually formulate them, to predict uh, needs and act on them before they might even happen. Concepts being generated and rapidly assessed across desirability, feasibility, viability, sustainability and uh, market timing. Uh, all too often, we just uh, concepts are being generated consumer led, but not necessarily taking into account feasibility and viability in those early uh, stages. We might see uh, models where new scientific breakthroughs, if you plug that data pool into your um, concept generation engine, that are automatically translated to new product concepts for your consideration. If you're for example, a food and beverage uh, company, and there's a new scientific breakthrough that gets published around certain types of nutrition or ingredients that would improve people's sleeps. Wouldn't it be great if you would be notified of that and the system would automatically take those new scientific breakthroughs and actually come with product suggestions that would fit your brands, your portfolio, uh, and that you could consider moving uh, forward with. Um, we also expect to uh, see the emergence of products and services that evolve along their life cycle. Uh, 
um, so that they're more in line with the latest customer needs. And last but not least, we would see the current like synthetic testing against synthetic consumers, and we will come back to that uh, in, in a minute, into synthetic worlds that are more holistically modeling human behavior to test new products and services within that as uh, a digital twin uh, would do. So a couple of options um, of uh, where things could go. And overall, if we look at um, it from a methodology perspective, we see a historic development in terms of innovation methodology from uh, design thinking in the 90s, which uh, pioneered human-centered uh, design methods based on empathy and creativity, lean startup in the 2010s, which uh, pioneered and introduced uh, much more iterative hypothesis-led experimentation and validation cycles to um, what we call autonomous innovation, which is the AI-powered imagination creating and scaling of new products. Obviously, we're two steps into a, a marathon race, so we're only at the very early days of uh, where this could go, and it will take us a couple of years to build uh, towards more effective uh, innovation engines. Um, when we look at um, the current AI models and having run many of our projects with clients as well, experimenting, pioneering uh, those new uh, systems, the key main or the key benefits that we see uh, for innovation are moving faster, um, moving faster from A to B and in the end leading to a faster go to market, creating more, you can exponentially diverge in, in ideation, but also in the amounts of product concepts that you can move forward with much more than we uh, normally can. And obviously also importantly, we uh, are confident that we could increase the product success rate in the market by having AI models uh, create, test and simulate new concepts uh, better. Uh, and here, I just wanted to open up uh, the floor and, and get your input as well on how uh, you would prioritize uh, those benefits uh, and what would be your priority from the tree. So if I could encourage you to just take your mobile phone um, and just scan the QR code that's on the screen um, and it will lead you directly to uh, this question and you can just vote on one of the three uh, options. And I'm seeing the, the first votes uh, coming in. Thank you for participating. So I'm just gonna give this a couple of uh, seconds. All right, answers are obviously still uh, coming in and, and thanks for submitting them. You can keep on uh, doing so. Uh, but interestingly, we have uh, almost a tie for the number one spot between uh, increasing the product success rate uh, on the market um, and uh, moving faster. So interesting to see that you're um, primarily leaning towards the success in market and the speed much more than actually the uh, allowance of more uh, divergence and creating more products uh, than uh, we could. Um, moving on, so what we are currently seeing is the emergence of a new AI-powered uh, innovation engine. And um, for us, that consists of three key elements within, uh, within that, uh, generate, validate, uh, curate. And maybe just to run uh, through a really quick, simple example, let's let's stick with the food and beverage company. And let, let's say you want to uh, create new beverage uh, products. So you would generate new beverage ideas with uh, the current LLMs based on data that you feed it with or data that's already there. And you prompt it based on uh, your uh, demand spaces, uh, brands, et cetera. 
Um, you would move along with quickly validating that with uh, synthetic consumers, set, which we'll come back to, and you would humanly curate that with the best ideas. And, and for us, it's important that there is still a human curation role as, as part of, of that process, either on a model level or specifically at steps uh, in, in the process. And then you would start the next cycle based on the prioritized ideas. You would start generating uh, visual designs uh, of, of those. You would validate the visual pack designs, for example, with uh, consumers. You would curate again, generate, and basically you would increase the levels of fidelity each cycle you, you run through uh, with this. Um, having looked at that, what we could see uh, it evolve to more in the future is towards more autonomous innovation, where that curation role becomes more minimal or looks at it more on, on a model level where we generate and validate in really quick uh, cycles. And maybe it's interesting to look at an edge case. Um, and, and as an example, so we're looking at uh, Shein here, which is the uh, obviously controversial um, Chinese uh, fashion uh, brand. Um, but if you look at them as an edge case, they are pretty interesting to uh, to learn from as well. So Shein launches a thousand new products each day. So just take that in for a second and compare that to um, the amount of new products that your company introduces maybe per year. Uh, and then consider that Shein launches a thousand new products per day. Uh, how, how do they do that in obviously simplified uh, way so they generate a thousand new fashion items per day they generate that based on uh, social listening as one of the data inputs so for example if there's something trending a celebrity that did something with red bananas the system would generate t-shirts with red bananas on on there um, it would immediately uh, push it into the web shop and then it would get validated uh, or and, and decided upon whether it could be uh, killed or scaled. And probably out of the thousand, they would kill 900 that don't get any traction. And then the other hundred would be uh, scaled up. Uh, obviously, on the back end of this, to make this possible, they have shortened uh, the time from concept generation to full scale production and distribution, which they all do centrally, uh, mostly from one uh, location to just three days. So they auto generate um a, a new product concept put it in the web store and uh after three days uh it's it's produced and and shipped uh, around the world as i said it's it's a controversial and edge case um they they had product launches that that gone wrong as well most definitely but it's interesting to look at an edge case of what like this would be uh in terms of um a more autonomous uh, innovation cycle, but also you could easily see this at play in digital services. For example, uh, in in music, you could you already have a pretty good song or AI song generators. You could have a model that generates a thousand new songs per day, puts them into or exposes them in the Spotify algorithm to a, a small subset of people, and then kills or scales them depending. Uh, on whether they get any traction and you can have that iterative cycle. Um, I think if you look at those models, they kind of start from the basic assumption that uh, more quantity in the end will lead to better quality uh, or better uh, product uh, market success. Um, so looking at some of those examples, I think our general point of view is that AI unlocks the potential for innovation to be not just constant, but also more autonomous. We are not advocating for systems to necessarily become fully autonomous. This could be components of your innovation engine, but always with that human curation role, obviously an underpinning uh, all of it. Um, if we uh, move from uh, that take on autonomous innovation, let's have a look at um, how do we start building, building a new innovation engine uh, around this. First of all, it's important to understand the unique capabilities that AI models currently have. And we're seeing having them unique capabilities for synthesis, ideation, and modeling human behavior. 
And we're not only seeing that empirically in the projects we run, but also in the studies that we that are being published and that we're closely following. Um, so, for example, there was a study. There's been a couple of studies on uh, using LLMs for ID generation. I think across all of them, uh, the general pattern is that uh, um, GPT generated ideas are at least equally valuable. Uh, and often as creative as humanly generated ideas and concepts. Um, and this specific study uh, even concluded that GPT-4 generated ideas uh, were actually rated higher in terms of purchase intent uh, from customers than the humanly generated uh, ideas. So in terms of uh, ID generation, um, it, it has unique capabilities, but also in modeling uh, human behavior. So we've had comparative studies against uh, asking synthetically modeled uh, people or personalities uh, and benchmarking that across populations and actual people. And almost all of the studies uh, have concluded that um, the results you're getting are valid um, and so it's another unique uh, ability of AI models um, in terms of modeling uh, human uh, behavior. Um, for us, there is no time to wait to start building your new innovation engine. As we see the first movers already leveraging AI to create new products uh, and services. For example, last week, you might have seen the news on Coca-Cola uh, unleashing uh, their Y3000, which is a, a soda that kind of, or that, at least pitches to taste like the year uh, 3000 and which was in part autonomously generated with uh, AI. Uh, we're seeing that in, in software development with already uh, about 50% of all the code uh, of all the digital products that are being developed on uh, GitHub being generated with GitHub Copilot, which is the AI Copilot. But we're also seeing that, for example, in, in healthcare where AI is enabling the discovery of new drugs by autonomously ideating and testing potential new molecules for uh, existing uh, conditions. Um, when we look at like the transition that we're making or the unlocks that we're seeing from the old to the new, here are uh, a couple of them. So um, up until now, we've mostly been applying human imagination based on uh, insights and often disparate data that are scattered across different documents, data sets in, in companies, but not like uniformly accessible uh, to people. Whereas we see that moving to uh, turbocharged human plus AI imagination, so leveraging the ID generation capabilities that we just touched upon of the LLMs and through trusted data, like having an AI model, an LLM that has access to all of your internal data, for example, all of the insights and research data and can bring you uh, the synthesis uh, of uh, that rather than having to shift through uh, PDFs uh, after PDFs. Um, we're hopeful to move from a process which is fairly siloed, faced, and, and still fairly slow, if you come to think of it, across the innovation journey, which is based on projects and stage gates. Um, and at least our hope is that we will evolve towards a more organic, iterative, and uh, much faster process as more and more components of the innovation process become uh, more uh, autonomous, and we'll talk uh, about some of them in, in a minute. Um, I think at the moment, if we look across the board, products are still launched pretty infrequently uh, and are often infrequently updated. Um, with autonomous innovation, it would enable you to do more launches, maybe not to the extent of a Shein that does a, a, a thousand product launches per day. I don't think that's the ambition that many companies would have or should have but more frequent uh, than we currently do. And also those products being more personalized, especially uh, if we're talking about digital products and, and services. Still, when you see survey after survey from CEOs and how happy they are with innovation, you still see that there is a general unhappiness about the product success rate, like the success rate of products being launched to market, being uncertain uh, and not reliable uh, enough. 
uh, using uh, or leveraging more autonomous innovation going forward. Um, we're confident to be able to increase product success by having pre-simulated uh, data as well as more real-time uh, market validation, uh, but we'll come to that in a bit uh, as, as well. So um, when we talk about building towards an autonomous innovation engine for us, that um, consists of multiple uh, sub engines and just want to quickly uh, walk you through uh, some of those. So at first it starts with an insights engine that, and this list of keywords below is, is obviously non exhaustive, but that would, for example, capture all of your social listening data that would capture the scientific breakthroughs to be translated into product concepts as we touched upon earlier it would contain of all of your proprietary uh, data pools around sales data customer uh, feedback and and all of those uh, things which would feed into a concept engine so basically you want to have as many relevant uh, data sources inside sources to feed into your concept uh, generator we talked about uh, how llms have proven to be effective uh, concept uh, generators, almost equally to a uh, human uh, capability. We would see concept screeners being modeled into that engine. You would want to model your brand models to stick to the example of the, of the global food and beverage company. So you, you would want your demand spaces modeled in there, your, your brand positionings, your uh, target customers so that you could prompt the signal, uh, prompt the system. Um, for example, when you would start a new uh, project, you could prompt it saying like, hey, I'm looking for a new uh, coffee uh, beverage uh, that would target morning occasions for Gen Z uh, consumers in uh, Vietnam around demand space uh, XYZ. And based off all of the knowledge that it would have, it would start to generate relevant concepts uh for for that brief that is still reactive maybe in the future it could become more proactive if it knows your strategy that would start to self-generate concepts relevant uh to that um equally importantly um what we're very much working on is to upgrade the current simulation engines to validate those concepts uh across desirability uh which we touched upon feasibility uh, and viability and it's it's so important to to have feasibility and viability early on in the process and i think we we all uh, know that but because as an organization we're often organized in in silos it's sometimes difficult to get all the points of view early on in in the process um and i think llms and especially ai agents that you can model um could could interact uh, at every stage of the process. What if you would have an AI agent from manufacturing, uh, one from uh, sourcing, uh, one from marketing, one from like any other relevant actor that you would have, and they would work on each stage of uh, a concept being developed and tackle it from from all different angles. We're already seeing those type of simulations, and we're. Um, very confident they can successfully be applied in the innovation context uh, as well next to the concept engine the simulation engine to validate you would obviously have a built engine which would consist of uh, generative desi design components generative coding components for digital and a, a production uh, system obviously and between the concept simulation and built engine you would have iterative cycles um, between them leading then to a launch and scale engine uh, which could have elements of a more autonomous launch components like we have seen with with chain maybe for the food and beverage company that we talked about they could also have a a web shop where they would more autonomously launch beverage concepts and see which traction they they would uh, get um, we're likely to see the emergence of more autonomous products, um, especially in, in digital products and services that would adapt to whoever is in front of them and that would uh, personalize based on um, the, the person that's using uh, the service and more autonomous market and, and go to market uh, tactics. So this is our uh, overview of um, 
the innovation engine that we are uh, working on, that we're working on obviously across projects and, and with clients uh, as well. And what we picture we will be maturing in uh, the coming months and years to a more autonomous uh, innovation engine across all those sub uh, engines. Maybe just to plug in one uh, very concrete example, um, uh, to use the example of Shein, so the Chinese uh, fashion brand. So um, if you look at it across uh, these innovation engines, so they take social listening data, uh, the story of the, of the red uh, bananas, uh, they auto-generate uh, concepts with it, uh, and they, they actually immediately get it to an autonomous launch and an autonomous validation uh, in, in the scale engine. And on the back end of it, they've uh, perfected their production and distribution system. So they have a three-day turnaround from production to distribution. So this is what an extreme edge case looks like. Again, we're not advocating for others to just copy this. Um, but it gives you an idea of what this edge case looks like uh, mapped out across uh, the innovation uh, engine. Uh, just wanted to give um, you the floor as well again and, and get your thoughts on, like, if you look at it across this um, autonomous innovation engine, where would you focus on uh, first in terms of upgrading that sub engine towards being more autonomous, towards being more AI powered, where do you think uh, the biggest gains uh, could be could be realized? Um, if you could get your smartphones uh, out again, um, that would be great. Uh, I'm really curious to see uh, what you think. Just give it a couple of more seconds. Answers coming in. All right, let's see what we get. So, um, well, clear point of view is that you feel that the insights engine is where you would prioritize and then moving along with the concept engine and the simulation uh, as uh, seconds and, and thirds um, and then not focus all too much on the build engine and the scale engine so I think in general um, I guess to draw one conclusion from it and that's also in line with with our general point of view is um, that we see a lot of potential to make the front end of innovation uh, more automated and, and more autonomous. Um, and you've also prioritized uh, the more front end parts of the innovation uh, process. Thanks a lot for, uh, for sharing your thoughts uh, here as well. When we look at um, launching new products to market and increasing the product market success, uh, there are generally two roads uh, to take. Uh, on the one hand, you could say, let's just uh, autonomously launch new products and validate them in market directly. That's the Shane uh, model, the thousand new products per day. Or you could go the route of advanced simulation. Like what if we could evolve the, the current uh, synthetic consumers and get them to higher, even higher fidelity so we can uh, predict uh, market behaviors and predict market success in more of a simulation uh, type of environment. And I just want to uh, dive a bit deeper into one component of the, of the overall engine because we don't have the time to cover uh, all of it, but just diving deeper into the simulation uh, engine. Luckily, that was at least in your top three that you wanted to prioritize uh, and more specifically dive into desirability uh, simulation. So um, 
desirability simulation, a couple of angles uh, to that. I think an interesting one was a recent study that was published uh, in Frontiers in Artificial Intelligence. Um, and what they developed is a method called uh, neuro forecasting. Uh, and, and they applied it here for uh, music songs. So obviously everyone is always looking to um, generate the next big uh, global uh, hit. Um, and the, so they applied uh, machine learning to neurophysiological data, which is data that you acquire by just uh, giving people like off the shelf sensors on, on their heads and then uh, track uh, how their brains respond to, to whatever you give them. And just on the neural activity of 33 people, so that's a, a pretty small subset, um, the, the model learned itself that it could predict um, the, the song's success with a 97% accuracy. So that's uh, a lot higher because it was benchmarked against the current methods of uh, which, which only get to 50% uh, accuracy. We're, so we're close to 100% accuracy. We're just applying machine learning on uh, the brainwave reads, if you want, of 33 uh, people. So imagine we could do this for other products uh, and develop um, models uh, around that. That would go a long way into uh, desirability simulation. So that in the end, obviously, what we want to prevent from doing is that we develop any products or launch anything to market that basically people are not really looking for and that just adds to the waste and the overload of stuff uh, we we already uh, have so that's one angle neuro forecasting another angle is uh, the evolution of synthetic uh, customers so synthetic customers for those that are unfamiliar with that is basically you use an llm like chat gpt or any of the other models and you ask it to represent a certain uh, customer, which could be a Gen Z gamer in Vietnam, and you give it an, a couple of other parameters. And that's what I referred to earlier. Like the first studies show that it's actually um, that that those representations are equally valid to doing that with, with real people. Um, and so what I wanted to take you through is the evolving abilities of these synthetic consumers. At the moment, most of them can just read and type. So this is a screenshot from a service called syntheticusers.com. Uh, um, and so basically, you can ask uh, synthetic users or, or customers uh, questions uh, around like the frustrations they might have around the problem space you're uh, exploring or uh, to test concepts or ideas that, that you would have. Uh, the next step is that synthetic customers will start seeing and talking which we already have on uh, the multimodal uh, LLMs like uh, Bing AI and, and, and other uh, platforms. Also, we, we've seen that on, on Kepler.io, which is a new service launched by two uh, ex-Google AI engineers just uh, very recently in the last two weeks. And you can feed them uh, brand assets, for example, and actually get um, feedback from your synthetically modeled uh, customers them also seeing uh, what you give them, not just reading uh, in, in text. Um, a, a next step uh, beyond that is that synthetic consumers start, start behaving and acting more, so you get more complex uh, simulations. We've seen the one from Stanford called Smallville. Uh, if you haven't seen it, definitely uh, have a look at that, which basically they had a whole sim uh, city uh, with GPT modeled uh, agents that lived like real humans for weeks with behaviors that are, were almost not um, to yeah not different uh, from from what you would observe in in real life on specific parameters. Uh, also, Amazon Go, for example, uses synthetic customers in a digital twin type of situation uh, to simulate uh, situations that are very rare. Uh, to happen the same we see with uh, autonomous cars uh, etc so acting and behaving uh, but it shouldn't necessarily uh, stop there there was a, a new research published i think only last week or two weeks before um, where they uh, developed a neural network um, that was trained on all of the smells 
uh, or at least like a very broad set of, of smells. So could we in the future even have uh, synthetic customers that start smelling and tasting, which obviously could be relevant for the, the hypothetical food and beverage company that, that we've been using uh, as an example going forward. Um, so at the moment, synthetic customers are proven to, to be valid. Uh, but can only read and type, they start to see and talk, will move into more act and behave, but potentially also into smell and taste and a lot of other sensory uh, inputs. Maybe an important caveat, we're not advocating for throughout the whole innovation process to just purely validate with synthetic customers. We see that as an important uh, new unlock in the early stages of innovation to go a lot broader in the ideas and concepts that you generate and you basically curate them down by synthetic testing to a smaller subset but those we at the moment uh, still uh, advocate for testing them uh, with real consumers as well but just a smaller subset uh, and because of all the pre-validation obviously the confidence rate that they would be better concepts is a lot uh, higher so that was just one element of the engine, the desirability simulation within the simulation engine. And I think if you were to start around building a new innovation engine, you would map out your architecture in a way that we've done here. Um, and you would start working that through, prioritizing where you would start building a roadmap on, on how to uh, evolve uh, those components and working through a maturity uh, scale, because obviously the, the models will still evolve uh, very rapidly. So as a second model that kind of goes hand in hand with it, uh, we've developed uh, five levels of autonomy uh, specifically for uh, innovation. And in a way you could compare that with what happened with autonomous driving, which has been going on for, for decades and which um, today in parts of the world like San Francisco is, is finally um, yeah, coming, coming to fruition. So it's definitely been a long journey and it will be more of a journey in terms of adoption in the coming years uh, as well. But so similar to autonomous driving, we'll see a progression from AI powered uh, components that offer near term benefits, benef benefits, sorry, like adaptive cruise control or assisted parking. Uh, in, in vehicles or emergency braking uh, and all of those things to the ultimate goal of more autonomous uh, driving. So that's what we're seeing similar in innovation as well. There's a lot of near-term benefits to be had around synthetic testing, etc., while actually you're building towards your moonshot innovation engine. So it's working on both the near-term uh, as well as uh, the long-term. Let's just quickly take the um, maturity model and, and give you one example of, of how that plays out for running customer interviews. Um, and these are like the, the example we're giving here is actually running real customer interviews with human customers, just to specify that. So on level one, that's how we've always done it. Like uh, if you're the, 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 the service designer or the innovator in, in charge, like you plan and conduct uh, the interviews. Level two AI assisted would be you ask an LLM to uh, write the interview guide uh, for you. AI powered would be, well, actually we'll get an AI chatbot to conduct the interview, but from a guide that we uh, provide it with. Semi-autonomous would be that the AI chatbot would conduct the interview, but it goes off script based on the answers. It, it gets and it would dive deeper uh, into things. And autonomously would be that the AI chatbot would fully recruit, plan, conduct, and analyze the customer interviews and would only give you uh, the results, conclusions, and recommendations uh, from that. So um, maybe just as a practical example, uh, a platform that we've been uh, using is called outset.ai, which sits at the semi-autonomous level. Um, and in projects, for example, we ran uh, over 150 interviews uh, just over the weekend with none of our people involved with an AI chatbot that would interview customers that we trained in terms of the script uh, it would ask and the goals of, of the interview and the results have actually been uh, pretty uh, impressive. So that's an example of like uh, an ability that's already there that sits at the semi-autonomous uh, uh, level. 
Um, also quickly wanted to get your uh, point of view uh, on that. Uh, if you think through the different levels, uh, really curious to hear, like where do you think we are now on the journey to autonomous innovation? Uh, going from human only over AI assistance, AI powered, semi-autonomous to autonomous. So not on one specific task, but if you look at your whole innovation process that you are managing at, at your company, uh, the whole innovation system, where do you feel that we are uh, or that you are at the moment? Right, I'm sure we'll get more answers in, but I think there's a pretty clear answer to, to the question here. So most people feel that we're at level two, which is AI assisted. And that's that's definitely my take as well, if I, if I just look at it uh, broadly in, in the market. And that actually ties back to what I started off with, like typically what we do when a new technology emerges is that we we keep on doing the same tasks that we've done, but we just ask the new technology to assist us with that. Uh, remember like the PDF newspaper when it when it moved online. Uh, I think that's the stage that yeah, most most are in at the moment. And I think if there's one message from uh, this webinar that we want to give is to kind of think at it more holistically and how can we rethink the whole of how innovation is done uh, in a more AI powered and in our minds, in a more autonomous way, not to say that it needs to be uh, fully uh, autonomous. I'm also super curious about the 1% that, that answered autonomous. So maybe in the chat, if you feel uh, up for it, you can elaborate uh, on, on what you've built uh, in, in that space. Um, so uh, as a conclusion around like the second part on, on building a new kind of innovation engine, I think in general, we believe that AI powered autonomous innovation can be a real competitive advantage for companies uh, moving a lot faster, bringing products to market with a higher uh, degree uh, of success. And we just wanted to give you a starting point, shaping your own strategy around that. And for that, I'm happy to hand over uh, the floor uh, to you. Uh, Jeff. Excellent. Thank you, Phil. And I just wanted to take this moment, first of all, just to acknowledge that I am actually a real human, not just the chatbot, which was a, a question that came up in the chat. But yeah, so I think so in terms of like how it becomes that competitive advantage, I think it's really important to think about how that works. You know, a lot of the early days of people using generative AI, it was all about, you know, how do you just play around with chat GPT using internet data that's really evolved when now working with companies we're really looking at how do they actually you know how do they actually really figure out how to use this at scale and how do they combine both the internet data and their in internal data but also their internal capabilities so the way that we see this evolving is that companies should start out as explorers right so you're trying to figure out What's an experimental version of the engine that Phil just talked about? Some targeted capability building. And then you want to deepen that expertise and become more of an expert, maybe just in applied select areas, but not broadly embedded, and then start to scale, right? So actually building out and integrating this into the majority of your innovation efforts, embedded in your organization and people, how people are trained, hired, who's hired. Um, and ultimately, it becomes this differentiator, right? You actually have the, you know, the entirety maybe potentially of your innovation efforts running through this model and it's, and it's fully, fully embedded in the way that people work. And I think it's important on that, that we really see that this investment in autonomous innovation yields both near-term results while getting you to that longer-term vision. So it's not like you have to wait eight years, 10 years, 20 years as the autonomous car companies have had to do. Uh, you can actually get some results faster. You can get results very immediately by moving faster, moving, moving broader and at lower cost, but also build towards this future advantage. Um, and in terms of how we see companies getting there, the, the first piece obviously is to figure out what does this all mean for our company and what's our strategy around innovation in the new world of AI, right? So actually figuring out how do we actually identify 
what are they going to be the unlocks for us as an industry, a category, a company, a culture, a group of people, um, and then using that to start to identify what the right engine is for you, as Phil had talked about. Uh, but then there's two pieces that are critical to actually do anything with that. First of all, um, is actually thinking about how do you actually put this into action uh, through actual launches and actual projects that actually deliver. So thinking about how that can happen in a way that is uh, faster and showing the value of AI. So these kind of demonstration projects that we've been looking at. So this is a, a lot of where we started with some of our clients is figuring out how to start to put it into practice and get some, some points on the board. And then the last piece is actually the organization and people transformation. So this is obviously, this is about, you know, the processes and systems and the people that you have today, but also who you need to be in the future, right? So there will be lots of new jobs created by AI, contrary to what people might say. There will be masses of people who need to be hired to do model fine tuning, to be AI ethicists. And the role of innovation and strategy teams is going to evolve to, to really incorporate those capabilities. And so generally how we see this going is that companies need to see this as like a, a product that they're building, right? This, this engine is going to take a while to build, um, but it's going to start to show uh, immediate payoffs from, from the very beginning. So in the first year, let's say, roughly, we see that the goal is to really kind of streamline projects, improve quality, improve consistency, increase the focus on desirability, on viability and feasibility, but, but do this within a handful of projects, prove it out, develop the business case, and then also develop out the plan for actually what talent you need as well. Stage two is really looking sort of medium term into how do you actually translate this into a, an at scale competitive advantage in the things you're already doing, and an increased innovation hit rate around the current go-to-market model that you have. So think of this as like engine 2.0. So you're expanding from, you know, custom fine tuning of one or two LLMs to multiple. You're looking at uh, actually these projects getting to launch. You're actually looking at starting to test out how this new autonomous go-to-market model could work. And then over the longer term, you really end up having, and, you know, we don't really want to put a time frame on this because it's very hard to predict, but over the longer term, you really actually have this uh, position where you have the engine deployed and evolving. It's running all your efforts, or rather it's being run by people, but it's working autonomously. And you actually have this competitive advantage, both against startups and incumbents, because you actually have the integration of everything you know and everything you could know in the future integrated into the way that you're making decisions. Um, and so as we think about this, I guess the question is, you know, to, to, to the group um, and open to questions and answers on this, what is your strategy? Do you have a strategy? Is this something you are starting to think about um, and any of the key challenges that you're that you're seeing? And we, you know, we, we would love to offer up to do these leadership sessions with folks to discuss this. You know, we have, a, as Phil has taken you through, we have a vision of what the future engine could look like. What are the stages to get there? What are the big questions you need to answer? And so we'd be very happy to actually set up these leadership sessions with you and your team to actually figure out what is your strategy and what's the right engine that makes the most sense for you and how you can start to put that into action. Uh, and then the last thing we wanted to get into before we have Time for questions is that we have a very special invitation to a summit called the Autonomous Innovation Summit. Uh, it's going to be the first, I guess, the first week of, of December. Um, this is going to be the biggest global gathering in AI powered innovation. We have speakers from OpenAI, from MIT, from PepsiCo, industry, tech, academia, um, over 30 speakers over two days, two stages, and it will really be unpacking all of the issues that we've identified here today and many more that we didn't have time to get to as well. And so uh, I think Sina will put into the chat the uh, the invite for the, for the summit, and we'd be very delighted 
to see you there at that. Uh, and I guess at that point, want to open up the floor to any additional questions. And maybe we can address some in the chat. Yeah, there's an interesting question here around open innovation and how this works with that. I think it is a very, it's a very interesting opportunity to actually think about how you can expand the boundaries of your innovation ecosystem beyond just your internal data, your internal people. Uh, yeah, I don't think we've actually really figured that out yet, but I think that's an interesting topic and certainly one we could get into more detail around in the in the summit. Another question maybe we can tap into is thinking about the agent GPT model. The question is like if multiple companies are basing their insights recommendation yeah. on the same data set, like how can we identify like where competitive advantage comes from? I think that's a, a great question because at the moment, obviously the LLMs are all trained on the same data. So basically the only thing you can get superior results with is the prompting uh, to get better results uh, out of it. Clearly, the next step is that the models and, for example, also the synthetic customers that we talked about, synthetic customer panels, will be trained on proprietary uh, data. What if for the customers that you really want to target, uh, what if you would uh, follow like 30 people uh, around in their daily lives or how they work around like the, a grocery shop if, if you're in that food and beverage uh, category? Uh, and actually model your synthetic consumers with much re richer proprietary data based on that. We, we looked into the example of the, the neuro forecasting for, uh, to predict uh, songs uh, and how successful they will be. What if you apply neuro forecasting and actually do some of your own research around your product categories? So you build a predictive model uh, around that. That's clearly the next step is is building up these proprietary data pools and and fine-tuned models uh based based on those yeah i think it's a really important point i think yeah there will there will not be like one llm i think in a given large company there might be dozens of llms that are trained and fine-tuned in certain ways and it's not like you're going to be interacting with that in a chatbot necessarily that might be integrated into microsoft teams or your spreadsheet package or, or whatever it might be um, another question was, what are the rules to describe a synthetic uh, user so the results are valuable? Maybe maybe on that, if you want to dig a bit deeper into that. So you have platforms that would kind of take you through that journey, like synthetic users or Kepler that we, uh, that we mentioned, but we also often just model them on the internal LLM on, on the client side. Uh, we're happy to share some of the of the research that we have gathered around that and, and academic papers as well that give you more insight around what needs to hold true for those results to be uh, valuable. Yeah, uh, uh, maybe I'll take the one on simulation follow up. So if simulation is a key pillar, how is this ongoing accuracy ensured and scientifically substantiated? Yeah, it's really interesting. So maybe just quickly, because I know we're coming on time. So a lot of the existing research has shown that it's actually incredibly accurate at predicting human behavior. Um, that's actually going to get better over time, though, as we can actually do more actual A-B testing and further refine and improve the models based on how they respond versus actual real responses. And I think our goal now is to figure out how can they actually be better um, than actual what people say, um, because we know there are all, always limitations to what people will say in an interview or how they respond in a certain focus group or, or testing environment, no matter how real it is. Um, so our goal is that we could actually even get better and maybe eliminate some of that bias. Maybe that brings us at time and I wanna respect everyone's uh, time as well um, and, and wrap it up here. I hope we've been able to give you a perspective on where we see the future of AI powered innovation go, which in our minds is towards more autonomous innovation, what the drivers are behind that, the components in a future innovation engine and some of the roadmap and, and maturity levels uh, towards that. For us, this is very much the starting point of 
of a conversation with with all of you i think as a global innovation community we have to take on the challenge of making innovation in itself better and and more affecting using some of the new models so that's also why we're organizing the summit to kind of get broad perspectives uh, and ideas in and to make this uh, a broader conversation within the whole uh, global innovation community so uh, if you have any um questions from this any builds maybe on, on what we have presented any ideas or prototypes that you have worked on it would be absolutely great if you would reach out and and join the conversation uh, around that um that's uh what we what we hope to do uh here uh, i hope this at least was a valuable uh, starting point of that discussion for you uh, and happy to engage on this uh further uh, and obviously hoping to see you uh, potentially at our next uh, webinar which will be a deep dive into synthetic research and synthetic uh, customer testing um, and uh, on the summit in December uh, which will get all of those like broad and expert perspectives uh, across uh, the board thank you for today uh, we will follow up with uh, the recording the presentation some links for all of you in in an email uh, so you'll have that as well and hope to see you uh, next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.